Uh, welcome everybody to the Barber Advanced Design Center. We are joined today with a very special guest, came all the way over from the UK, Mr. Frank Stephenson. Thank you for coming, sir. Uh, it's been a pleasure to get to meet you and talk with you and hear some of your ideas. And uh, we're very honored to have you travel all this way and come to the other Birmingham, yeah. uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah. Uh, so uh, oh. it's great to have you here. Thank you very much, Brian. Yeah, it's not that far. I mean, it might seem far from you guys, but we call it a pond. And, you know, so it's just over on the other side, as they say. Um, it's, uh, it's, for me, it's, um, I, I didn't want to uh, talk about Mecca or the Vatican today, as I mentioned this morning. But it is kind of like going to one of these places that you have to do it at least once in your life. And um, I'm sure I'm going to be back. So it's not just my first time, I hope. Um, but a real honor. For me, I've been in the design industry for basically all my life. I guess my all my professional life, I've been designing, well, mostly cars. Um, and I started when I, uh, my father told me, you better do something that you're good at rather than just trying to um, try to be good at something. So I, I kind of had a talent for quite a while in uh, drawing and science and math and physics and biology and all that. And it was really like that kind of stuff, but to be able to put a, a life a profession that is based on those kind of subjects is, is just a, a blessing, I think. So I'm kind of lucky to be, be there, have done that and been here now. So um, we talked about this a bit, you know, just the moment when you knew that you wanted to do design, cool. you know, that moment um, you, you, you raced motorcycles um, growing up as a teenager, and then there was that moment where you saw something and, um, you know, the spark was ignited and um, talk about that. Um, well, I think I got to set the record a little bit straight there. I don't think you can become a designer. I think you either are a designer or you're not. You're wired from the beginning when you first <laughs> start doing things in life. You're wired to be a little bit different than what I was strange. We'll see us as a bit of the, the weirdos in the industrial field because we have crazy ideas. We see things that you guys don't see. Um, you know, anybody who thinks like that or gets excited about that is sort of like on the edge. And I think to be a good designer, you kind of have to be out in le left field most of the time and not thinking the way most people think. And that's where you get a lot of innovation and stuff that you think that isn't going to work can potentially work and bring a benefit, which it's not just about what I do is not just about designing something to look good. It actually has to bring a benefit to what existed before. And I think that's what separates a designer from an artist. And of course, we're not engineers. That gets a lot more detailed, but at least we can provide something for the engineering team to also get a lot of satisfaction to be able to bring something better than what existed before <clears throat> so that we move the game onwards all the time. Um, yeah, but again, I, I come from a pretty, I guess you'd call it, an exotic background. I don't. I didn't realize I was being brought up in any way exotically, but it was just my way of living. I was born in Casablanca, Morocco. Uh, my father's originally from uh, Scandinavia, but his whole family moved to the U.S. and um, that's the way I, I've understood the story. And uh, he basically uh, is uh, sort of an American, I guess you could say. And uh, my mother's uh, Southern Spanish, which is very different part of Spain from northern Spain. It's kind of like what you guys have here between the north. Um, they're a lot looser, a lot happier, a lot more uh, uh, go lucky, a lot more creative, they're more into arts and culture and stuff like that. A lot of the influence of Spain is more known from the south, well, what it is. So there's a, a father who's uh, very northern. It, uh, my father was very strictly all about precision and engineering and uh you couldn't make it any better than 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 what you've done uh my father is extremely ocd i don't know if you know about that but i grew up with that sort of hanging over me uh and then my mother's wild creative cultural sides so i think that kind of blend is what makes a designer probably a designer from genetics and uh growing up in morocco i, I wasn't really exposed with cars or mechanics or anything like that when I was in my growing years up to about my teens. So I was more into the courses and donkeys and whatever, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, but my father started a dealership uh, in southern Spain in the early 60s with my mother's brother, my uncle, and I got to go there every summer. I, I didn't, didn't do the usual kid things. I, he just put me my butt to work in a body shop, and I, I learned to get my hands dirty but also be creative at the same time. So it was kind of that movement towards uh, loving cars and being creative and then sitting in the dealership looking at the, all these cars that were coming on onto the market, but imagining what would they look like if I could see them five years, 10 years from now. So I had this artistic vein of imagining you know, cars uh, in the future and sort of sparking that what if kind of thing without knowing that car design was a... Uh, um, but you could all fast draw. You, you knew you could draw. Yeah, I was that kid that yeah. can you draw me a horse, can you draw me a birthday card, can you draw me a whatever, so I had to draw all that stuff. But yeah. And there was one one day that I remember like it was yesterday, which is March 19th, um, 1969. Um, I was walking down on uh, Mohammed V Boulevard uh, in Casablanca with my father, and I saw this uh, Series 1 fixed head coupe, uh, Jaguar E-Type, and I froze. I mean, I was a little kid, but I, f I remember freezing and just not wanting to move and staring at the car, and my father was getting upset because hey, we got to go, and... The last thing I remember is him pulling me away and I was crying. I just didn't want to leave this mechanical, beautiful object there. And I think maybe that might it had a last virus. Yeah. The lasting effect on you yeah. to see that. So that was part of the moment. So uh so you go to Art Center, you come mm -hmm. to the States, uh you go to school four years, you live in, in the US, you go to mm -hmm. Art Center, uh and you're you, you graduate in eighty six, which interesting I, I found out that you were in the same class as Miguel Galuzzi, who yeah. designed the Ducati Monster. Yeah. Uh, and uh they're in the same class together at Art Center in Pasadena yeah. in California in nineteen eighty six. Yeah, we were we were, that was the Green Gray, I think, that year. We were we were the sort of the guys that uh we survived. I don't know if you know about Art Center College of Design, it's the premier at least it was that's the way they told us. <laughs> This is the best college and university in the in the world to learn uh, car design. And back in the '80s, it changed a little bit. But back in the '80s, um, they had you know a few thousand applicants for every starting semester, and they'd only choose a certain number of them. Uh, you'd have to submit a portfolio. They'd have a committee that would review your work, and then you got the news: yes, you're accepted or not. You couldn't just say, "I want to go to study there." And uh, the first day of class. And there were 30 of us sitting in the room. And we thought, well, we're all hot shots because we're here. And the professor, teacher comes in and cuts you down the size, but he says, we've never had a class with more than 10 students finished. So two thirds of you will be out of here by the end of the, the school year. And everybody's like, nah, it's not gonna be me. It's not gonna be me. Well, six of us finished. One was Miguel Calus, the designer of the Ducati Monster. Uh, and then we had uh, Greg Larson, who designed the first Porsche Boxster. We had Craig Durfee, who did the first Dodge Viper. We had um, Miguel Arcel Galusi, who did the Monster, of course. We had uh, Andres Apatinas, who later became head of design of Alfa Romeo. We had Ken Okuyama, a foreign student, Japanese, who did the Ferrari Enzo, the Maserati Quattroporte, later became head of Pininfarina design. Uh, and then there's, and that was the sixth one. So yeah, it was a, we survived. We didn't graduate, we survived, yes. But it's so cool that you were all there together and mm -hmm. gone on to do many great things. So there was something, you know, maybe perhaps cosmic about 1986. And well, we were extremely competitive and truly, um, yeah, fiercely competitive. So I think each each one of us drove the other person. And if you want to be better, then you got to go further than him. But he's going to push you. And it's a it's a, it's a dog needing its tail kind of environment. Yeah, so uh, first job Ford hmm. uh, for the RS Cosworth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was uh, quite lucky because it, it is extremely expensive to go to this university there, and I wasn't in the best financial position. My parents had sold their house just to pay for my tuition and moved into a small uh, apartment. And I put a little bit of pressure on me. My father said, and I was, I was fat and happy, and just before I went to the university, I was racing doing pretty well on a professional circuit in Spain. And um, my father, again, just said, look, you're gonna be 30, burned out, you know, broken bones, and probably number two or number four, or something nobody's ever gonna remember you. 
So get out now and do something that you think you can be good at and I'll support you. So either come work for me now or go off and study. And so I went off and studied halfway through that education. After two years, Ford, uh, all the, the big three have a habit of coming to the universities and checking out future talent. So Ford said, if, if, you're, uh, if you can commit to us now, we'll pay for the rest of your education and uh, you'll have a job at the end. So I wasn't so stressed out when I was going for the, you know, the final. Um, yeah, so the first job offer was to go to uh, uh, work at Ford Design, and uh, I was all pumped up about it. But when they told me it was Detroit, I said, I'm not going to live very long if I move to Detroit. And uh, can I please have a job in Europe at your Ford Design headquarters in Cologne? And they said, yeah, we'll make a spot for you. So I went there, and it was incredible. Really, really amazing company to start your know, design career with because they have so many different models, ranges, and uh, really international design team, um, perfect training ground for your first uh, stop. You don't look at it as a stop. You think you're going to start there and finish there, but uh, yeah, I so go really. Them, yeah. That's that's what kicked you off into uh, car design as a profession. Yeah. Uh, BMW uh, after that yeah. for um, quite a few years. Yeah, um, you were a part of the the new Mini. Uh, yeah. program the x5 SUV yeah. bmw's first suv uh entry into the market mm. uh and then uh you know fiat uh maserati lancia alfa Romeo, yeah. um and uh then ferrari no, uh, McLaren the, after that mclaren after that yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. and uh we we pulled together a few cars i don't know if you, some of you saw uh today we had four cars that you had designed out front of the museum yeah. that just happened to be in the park today. So, uh, so it was, yeah, they kind of, I mean, that kind of career is what you would wish for. And if it happens, you know, you be truly grateful for it. It's a lot of it's right place, right time. A lot of it is not being afraid of change. So many people get stuck in what they're doing and they wish they would have made a move and, and they have the reasons for doing it. You get family or whatever reason you don't want to change jobs and country but um it pays off and my father always told me that you know you you know nobody's you can't can't expect to be lucky but you can make the most of any situation you know if, if the opportunity arrives or arises and don't go for it because that's really the only way you're gonna grow and you should bite off more than you can chew because that's really the way you, you grow so all these opportunities that i saw could probably lift me to the next level um, paid off in the end, you know, you're scared when you do it. I got depressed, believe it or not. When I was offered the job after I did the new mini that you might have seen out there, um, a lot of car companies came and knocking and saying, you know, we'd like you to join our, our, our design company, our team. And I was just fat and happy, like I said, with, with BMW mini at then. And I got a job offer for the most incredible job that any designer ever, ever out there would, would cut off their right hand for here. Uh, and it was become a, a design director, first ever design director for Ferrari and Maserati. And of course I went for it. You don't say you're not gonna go to Rome if the Pope calls you, we go. And that's what I did. But then I got this immense sense of responsibility before I started that I wasn't gonna be the, they were gonna see through me. And I, you know, I'm not the guy that they're looking for. I can't design a Ferrari that's of any value to them or anything, but I went into, I don't, I don't mind talking about it now. Back then it would have been super embarrassing, but I went into major depression before I started work at Ferrari, thinking I, I am an idiot for, for dropping a 12 year career at BMW to take on this amazing job. I'm gonna be out of here in a year, but. And how do you follow Pin and Farina? I mean, you don't, yeah, you don't, they're, they're, you know, you can't follow an icon. Yeah. They're, they're an icon for, for re with a good reason, but you do what you can do. And if you're have enough ambition and motivation forward thinking into it, it works out. So, so I did that. And then, you know, like you said, one thing led to the next. And when I went from leading Ferrari and Maserati design to, um, Fiat to, to pull Fiat out of the, out of the dumps, kind of and design, designed the car for me. It felt like I was going from heaven to hell, but in the end it paid off, you know, it was, it was save a company with a design and McLaren and stuff like that. But now it, this was the Fiat 500. Yeah, Fiat 500 um, did it in an extremely short time schedule. You can't really do a new car in 10 months, which was what they gave me to do a new car that would save Fiat. Um, 
but that was what they said to me, you got to pull off something in 10 months. And um, what I wasn't allowed to tell people was I didn't design a new car for Fiat. I just took one off the line, pulled the clothes off of it, the panels off of it, and put some new panels on it, which fooled the world that this was the rebirth of the Fiat 500. It was a Fiat Panda. You, know, you get the same car that exists, it just looked different, but it became sort of like the, the hit car, you know, the 2000s, late 2000s for, um, for a lot of the fashion crowd. And then we had the Abarth pocket rocket version, which didn't make it so much a chick's car, it became a guy's car at the same time. Save yeah. more than save the company, put it back on the map. So amazing. Yeah. And then McLaren. Yeah. Yeah. McLaren is probably one of the, I guess, um, from a design point of view, McLaren is like, for me, 2008, when they called me up, I was still with the Fiat, we're running the Fiat group design, um, which was Alfa Romeo, Lancia, Fiat, Alfa, uh, Ferrari, Maserati. When they call you up and say, uh, hi, McLaren's calling and we'd like you to be a design director. I had to tell them, look, I don't, I don't design race cars. I love race cars. It's my, in my blood, of course, but I don't ra I design race cars. It's another field that I've never gone into really. Um, they said, no, we're starting a car company because we're a Formula One car company. If Formula One ever goes downhill, we have nothing behind us. So we want to be like Ferrari. We want to do Formula One and racing, but we also need to back it up with road cars. So in 2008, they said, you know, you can start with a clean sheet of paper. We'll build the studio for you. We'll give you the, the facility for it. You've got to come up with uh, a design language. Uh, you've got to create a small team of designers around you. And we've got to get three cars out extremely fast, a sports car, supercar, and hypercar. And you got 10 years to do it to get us to the level of Ferrari. Ferrari at that time had been around more than 60 years, probably close to 70 years. And we had to do it in, in, in a fraction of that time. So it was a huge challenge because I'm sure all of you go at some point in time, oh, all cars look the same. And you know, you start to get to the supercar, hypercars, oh, they're all using the same formula. Well, I had to come up with a, a new language that didn't exist, design language yet at the same time was desirable from the get-go. All these guys that tell you, you're gonna get used to it, don't worry, six months or a year from now, you'll like the design. That's not good design. You have to have this love at first sight feeling when you really like a product and that sells the product. So the challenge was to create a design language that nobody else had ever done before. That was purposeful because McLaren's a hugely technologically performance-driven company. And the only way I could come up with was Ferraris, when I was doing there, all Ferraris I did, which was a great job, had to look like a Ferrari. And they're all fat, Italian, sensual, you know, cars that you wash for a few hours because you, know, you like washing the fender, it feels nice. Um, when your wife starts to get mad that you know, you're falling in love with her car. The other way around was if we, I, with a McLaren, you just suck everything out of it and shrink wrap it like it's a starving cheetah, you know, and that cheetah needs to eat and it's, uh, it won't stop at anything. So you're taking weight out of the design you created a very fit, athletic look. Nobody ever did that. And I'm hugely, like I said at the beginning, hugely into what's called biomimicry. And if you can design a car like nature would have designed the car, not a human, so which is all these principles of, of biomimicry. If I went into it, you guys would think this guy's absolutely nuts. But um, I, I bought a sailfish when I started with McLaren and uh, just spent some time with my wife in Caribbean and saw a sailfish. And, uh, found out that it was the fastest fish in the sea. And then I researched why it was the fastest fish and I'm thinking, man, this is pretty inspirational. On the way back to, to McLaren, London, just before I started, I bought one in Miami, had them stuff it, send it back to the, uh, to the factory. And when it came time to pick it up, it wouldn't fit inside the van, McLaren van. So I had to send a Formula One truck to Heathrow Airport to pick up this mega size, it was a big sailfish. And so that cost money, but I just signed it over to our design budget. And we brought it back, uh, opened it up and looked at it. And then we, then I sent it down to the McLaren Formula One paint department. They painted it like a, like a McLaren Formula One car. We put carbon fins on it and it was silver and or it was beautiful, but it looked like a McLaren racing fish. And then I got hauled on to the carpet in my, the finance, finance and guy in the PR, sorry, the chief, uh, she will HR human resources guy, I think we hired an absolute nut case here. Uh, how did you come to spend over 20,000 pounds on a fish? And I said, well, you know, it's kind of less secrets and we got to discover it. 
did a lot of wind tunnel. So you had to that. figure out how to turn that into a car real we quick. Did. That's what we did. <laughs> You'll see a lot of my sketches either include a, a fast animal or a fast fish or, and, and, and um, so it's fun, Brig. You know, it's purposeful design, and I can explain everything about the design of any car I've ever done using terminology of why nature would probably design it that way. So that you develop your own, you know, every car company has its own look, but at the same time, you want that car to be purposefully designed, not just a pretty picture. So, yeah. So, so well. So uh, then you went off on your own, and you start a consultancy. Yeah. Uh, Frank Stephenson Design, and you start using all of that experience and car design, and you're now diversifying, and yeah. you're going into other areas. Uh, uh, watches, you're you're wearing one of those watches. You do watch design. Yeah. Um, uh, a smart car seat. And, yeah. Uh, talk about that. You launched that at CES. Yeah. Uh, yeah we won first prize. What are the categories are? Um, I don't know. I mean. Finishing my career like four years ago, like corporate career, finishing it at at that point when we'd brought three great cars to represent McLaren to the market, it kind of felt like, I mean, I don't, I don't want to, you know, toot my horn, but it kind of felt like you'd reached top of Mount Everest. But once you're up there and everybody wants to get there, once you're up there, what do you do? You just sit there and, you know, try to stay up there because people, they try to pull you down. I thought, I got to get out of here. <laughs> and people are like, you're nuts because you got, you know, the job that everybody wants in the world and we've done it pretty nicely and we're on a, on a, on a wave right now. But I thought, you know, I sit here for another 10 years and repeat the supercar, the sports car, the super sports car and the hypercar, or I get out and just do some other stuff where I don't have marketing telling me what to design. I can just choose, hopefully. And uh, yeah, so we did that and I created my own design company uh, based still out of London where I was living when I was with McLaren and just threw it out there on LinkedIn of all places that, you know, I was creating my own design studio and just sit back and wait to see what came in. And uh, the offers were, I mean, you got everything from designing a, a toothbrush, you know, to, <laughs> to where you started thinking. Uh, I, I was looking for the other stream. I was actually looking not to design products for the world that were extremely uh, hard, you know, like if you design a McLaren, there's only like, I don't know, 50 people in the US maybe that get to enjoy a McLaren. So it's great you're bringing new technology into the industry, which later cascades down, but you're not reaching a lot of people. So I thought if I can sort of gear the studio with four filters, one obviously biomimicry influences our design, uh, but we absolutely must bring something new to the market with a design in terms of technology and innovation. And then it has to be the best in the best in whatever segment it does. It's not necessarily the most expensive, but if you were in that segment to buy a certain product, the one you want to buy is this one. So you're, you're, just, you're benchmarking everybody and saying, we're going to go one up on them. And the, the fourth one was a, um, another thing. It had to affect society in a sustainable way, which is the new thing. We hate it kind of as designers because it's a, limit but we are looking to the future all the time and environmentally friendly products are what sell now so and will more in the future past those four filters and it became something really interesting for us to take on and the first product was this uh what i don't know how many of you guys know about it but the new movement from we had you know we used to walk around then we got on horses then we got in carts and then we got into cars and then we had planes flying around and boats and all that so that's how we moved along and moving people around the world but what is coming in and you've heard it here, probably not first, but you, it, right. in two years, 2025, we're coming to market with what I can best describe as Uber for the sky. So not long trips, not going, you know, way out uh, more than an hour away or anything like that. It's kind of short hops. So if you've got to go to another state or country or whatever, you're probably going to fly there. Um, but what you will be able to do with these new air taxis, as we can kind of call them, is get into one four or five people, so they're not single or double seats or anything like that. You're packaging about four or five people into them, and you will have a vertical takeoff from the top of a hotel building or from a park or from an infield, not very large. Um, and really, there is no real pilot because we don't want what's called pilot error. We don't want anybody to have to make a decision. We just want the plane to go straight up, low altitudes, no oxygen required, and then straight as an arrow at 200 miles an hour, and land 
in a specific location, specific altitude, leave at a certain time. FAA control, so flight flight control, we, we, they know you're there. Uh, you won't see a lot of them crossing in front of you like that, so don't worry if they're going to be science fiction. But it is the new way to get to where you're going extremely fast and at student level prices, for example. Comfortable, enjoyable, and it's scary for all of us because we're efficient. <laughs> Not me, you guys go first. But the younger generation will grow up with this and it'll be the cell phone that we had to get used to. And kids accept it nowadays as the norm. This way of getting around will be an option. It's not going to take over anything, but it will be an option for, for us to get from A to B a lot quicker. Sure. Yeah. It's not too far of a stretch from uh, drone technology that kids are growing up with right now. Yeah. You know, you can buy a drone. Yeah, just scale that up. Or, but so they're going to think that that's, that's transportation, yeah. you know, 25 years. Absolutely. And it's kind of the introduction of like when we started with cars, I was mentioning this last night. There's not just going to be one look. It's like there's not one look in cars or one look in birds. They all do the same thing, but basically there'll be different different looks to them. So you'll have your favorites or whatever, but you know, and, and the levels will be different. You can fly around in a Rolls Royce style or in a Volkswagen style, whatever you want. But there won't be too many companies. It's still the early days, but it's that start of a new era of of, of transportation. And the coolest thing about it, I really find this fascinating is that if you really look at airplanes today, they're pretty, they're, there's nothing wrong with airplanes today, they're really nice ones and stuff, but they're really engineered. They don't call in designers to design these things, right? Because the engineering is like, this thing has to be above all flight worthy, and so we have to guarantee safety and all that kind of stuff. What do they do? They build a, a tube or sausage with a couple wings attached to it, and that's what they call an airplane. But if you ask nature to design a, an airplane, nature wouldn't design an airplane the way we see them today. They'd look into an object that has to go through a medium, huh? air, but if you look at what shape is the most efficient shape out there, it's not really a bird, it's a fish, because it has to go through a lot denser medium, right? Water, hydrodynamics. So optimally, if you could design a plane that looked like a fish, it would be a lot more efficient in terms of energy uh, efficiency and all that. So why not look into the sea for shapes that can inspire the design of these planes? And fish typically look pretty cool. You know, you don't hate fish. You don't hate birds. I do hate some cars and some planes. But so the first one I designed, uh, again, uh, it starts out in the front looking like a hammerhead shark with the canards and stuff. And then the body transforms or molds back into the shape of a, of a manta ray. So we, manta rays are gorgeous. The hammerhead sharks are a bit strange, but there's a reason for them. Um, but if you can blend those two shapes, then you have something that is more efficient than anything flying in the sky today. Much more stable, much more airworthy, as we call it. And then you build in what's called redundancy, so you have multiple uh, ways of if something fails on the plane, it's not going to go down. You go up in a helicopter and the rotor stops. You better start praying because <laughs> not a lot of ways to save you when that happens. But these will have very good methods of safety built in. So you're you're becoming a bit of an expert in these EV tolls, these uh, um, electric air attacks. Well, early bird does get the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. Yeah. So, and you're on your, your third one now, and I think we yeah. have a picture. Yeah, we got a picture of the one I'm currently working yeah. on. So this, believe it or not, is just a prototype. And the, new, the real one that I'm, this is a year and a half ago, maybe. Um, the production model is a lot prettier than this. And I, I can't really tell you why. Just believe me that it will look even cooler than this. And they all use different technology. You know, the the, the rotors on top. Some of them, uh, some of them rotate upwards and lift you up off the ground, and then they rotate forward and give you what's called horizontal flight transition. And some are. Uh, this one has a couple of rotors on the back. You can see that they're sort of pushing push props, as we call them. And the combination. So, and then there's ducted fans. The first one I did uh, for a German company had what's called ducted fans. So there are no rotors or propellers. It just sucks in air and chucks it out. And those rotors, multiple rotors, tilt 90 degree downwards, give you lift, you get up to what's the transition altitude. They sort of slowly start to uh, go horizontal and push you forward. And you go 200 miles an hour, 3,000 feet off the ground, land, uh, get out want to go back again and do it a little bit. <laughs> and it's not super expensive. That's and this is real. 
This is, we're already flying. These are already, you guys won't really know a lot. They're not, nobody really wants to put their cards in the table and say that here's where we're at. But I can tell you from the three companies I'm working with, they're all in the prototype stages. They all fly at private airports. They don't obviously fly where you can see them. So their, their location's a bit secret, uh, but they're going through test flights, test flights, test flights. And next year is the big year, 2024, where most of the, most of them, there are not a lot of them, probably five to 10 of them, the big, get, the big players. We're going to get certification approval from the Federal Aviation Administration. And in Europe, it's called EASA, European Air Safety Administration. And after they get certification, then it's just all the floodgates open up and we start getting ready for launch in 2025 when we start having all the land, landing pads built, um, uh, vert, vertiports, we call them. Um, it's a lot of organization for flight routes and, and all other kind of stuff that becomes critical for, for launch. Uh, which is a super exciting period as well but um yeah you're gonna have fun and and don't worry because it's not gonna be you're not gonna be safe same you know uh like sky jams i don't know what you would call it. yeah that won't happen not star wars yet no and you won't even hear them you'll have to look up they typically run around 45 db which is about what an electric car sounds but it's just going down the road so you're gonna have to look for them to see them yeah so, uh, so uh, car seat, uh, baby seat, um, electric yeah. aircraft. Yeah. Um, you you did a, a computer, a supercomputer, right? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. What is that? I was super challenging. You ask a designer to design a computer, and it's like, what? I don't know. <laughs> where do I start? Um, the sip, the, so there's a company based out of Palo Alto, California, where you get all these brainy guys that come out of Stanford University and stuff, and. Uh, they come up with all these ideas and you just gotta, you know, they contacted me, this, this group there, uh, at, well, uh, amazing team of guys, just brains, basically brains on legs. I don't know how else you can describe them. Um, and, uh, they realized that there's a problem worldwide problem, I guess, in, um, uh, climate prediction. So you get all these countries like in the middle of Africa or in India where the whole, you know, society is based on getting the timing of the agricultural uh, side of society uh, pinpointed in terms of planting and, and everything like that that has to do with the weather. Um, and they get it wrong. They rely on whatever resources sources that they have and they get it all wrong and they, they don't, they're not successful. So this company based out of um, uh, Northern California uh, decided to build the new super a quantum supercomputer, which might sound like physics and all that, which it is, but at the same time, it's the most powerful supercomputer out there, or it has to be. Um, and if you can remember back, maybe you don't remember back that far, or don't remember, but there was something called the Cray computer, which started off this revolution of supercomputers. And the Cray computer is still iconic because you can sit on it and you could, uh, and it looked like a piece of furniture and it was just the, the dawn of that era. So you could do anything you wanted with the design. No. A supercomputer you walk into a room there it's like robots there there's no design beauty or anything like that it's just machines stacked and you know uh um uh we like call it server racks just yeah racks, 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 racks. racks and it's not a pretty thing to yeah. see so they approached me and said from a designer point of view coming out you know like cross industry how would you design this thing and i'm like well there is the cray you know that kind of design influence where it doesn't look like a computer and then there's the other extreme where you know, you had HAL on 2001 of Space Odyssey, which is pretty cool. Um, but I think my opinion, if I was designing a computer for you guys, first of all, I got to know what, what it, how it worked. I got to know what components are. And I just want to design a pretty box. But I think this thing should either look like it came from outer space and landed on Earth, or it should be the feeling that it was from a future civilization that, I don't know, that we, or something from way in the past that was brought from somewhere in we discovered it in the desert. So you couldn't put a time look to the object. It can't look like it was influenced by anything else, right? It just has to look alien almost. And then um, they're like, yeah, that sounds good, but what's that gonna look like? I'm like, well, first show me what the components are. So a computer doesn't do anything except put a bit of software in some coolant liquid. That's how they cool it. Might sound weird to stick electronics in the liquid, but it, it's the way they do it. And then you just kind of dissipate the heat from that, uh, keep all the stuff that the components, 
and then cool it again. So basically, you're just building a, a, a like a radiator system almost. And all we did was come up with it. We went through a, a myriad of ideas of how we should do it, but we came up with the most simplest technological solution. So we, we run the heat into the bath of water, and then it goes up, vaporizes it, and then it cools off, and then it comes back down through another channel and just does that. And if you look at it, I don't know if we have it up here, Harry. We can show it. That's what it looks like. And there's a lot of ribs, but it's alloy. And uh, they want this to sit in the desert. They want it to sit in the mountains, in the jungles, in Antarctica, and everywhere. So it's going to get a patina on it eventually, but it will just fit in the environment. But you won't really put a date on it or anything like that. It's, uh, and now we have MoMA asking if they could actually put it at Museum of Modern Art, if we put it in there and you know have it have it sitting there and let people figure out that it's actually a computer. And they can sit on it. it yeah, yeah, it's robust. It's absolutely, uh, and feel a bit warm, but it's not the other. Yeah, that, that kind of technology. So that's kind of like a little hit a lot of more than people's societies. It's so, you don't buy it personally, of course, and government buys it and gets, gets it out there. But that kind of um, thing will have a huge uh, impact, I think, on society and do some real good. Uh, again, the, what you mentioned earlier there, Brian, about the baby seat, uh, what I mentioned to you was really interesting. We designed, uh, in this next time phase of our studio, a baby seat. Uh, didn't set out to design a baby seat for a car, but was were contacted by uh, a group, uh, the Israeli Defense, basically, part of the division that works with the Israeli Defense Forces. And they said, um, We've got this technology in house that we've been able to market very successfully with other, you know, the U.S. and uh, Russian military and the Chinese. They've all bought it because it's a, it's a lifesaver. It's not a death machine. It's a technology that we've had to come up with that when you send an armored vehicle into a war situation or, you know, uh, bo uh, bombs or mines or whatever, and our armored vehicles go over it and there's an explosion with our soldiers on board, all the vehicle does is go, <laughs> sorry, like that. And uh, nothing happens to the vehicle, but everybody's dead inside because of the energy transfer into the vehicle. It's a weird thing. You think well, nothing happened, but they're dead from the G-forces. So they came up with this so simplistic but amazingly effective device that they put under the seats of the soldiers. And that it takes an immense amount of G-force or absorbs a lot of G-force. And so now everybody's saving lives. You know, you, the, the energy doesn't go into the soldier, into the body. Uh, and that's what saved a lot of lives. And they said, now we want to bring it into the commercial world. What can we do that brings that safety to benefit for, for society? I did a bit of research, and we find out that in the USA, here, that the regulations for a baby seat are the same as when we had it in 1970. As the game hasn't moved on. And what you don't find out, or what they don't tell you about, is that babies are killed every day fast and securely in their seat belt, in their seats. And just minor impacts still kill them, but you can't sue the company because the baby, you were doing the thing properly and the company said, this is well, this is late, this is what we have to provide. Um, and in Europe, the regulations are since 20, since 2000. So what we thought is if we put this device into a baby seat, how will that improve those accidents that you don't read about that kill babies, minor impacts? And this thing boosted the, the level over two and a half times over the safe, current safest baby seat on the market. So you will feel guilty if you're gonna have a baby and you don't buy this seat. But anybody can buy it, it's pretty expensive, but um, they're not selling it through outlets and things like that. You can almost rent it. And because, because it's using what's called smart technology, when you finish with the seat, you give it back to the, to the producer, they check, see everything is either fine or not fine, they can replace it and then they put it back into the market. So there's a huge sustainable element to it. Um, it gets renovated and all that. But it is also probably the seat that you would think when you pick it up, this is this is not what they're selling it, is incredibly light, incredibly light because we're using the materials we use in the supercar industry, magnesium, carbon. And it's in the shape of a... Yeah, and the egg. shape was this, oh, this is the fun part. Sorry, guys. Um, it looks like an egg, right? And why does it look like an egg? Because an egg is the best shape to provide for your embryo before it gets born. And why is an egg the shape it is? All eggs are pretty, eggs have that same 
proportional size to it. Well, nature has figured out that shape for a lot of reasons. I'm not going to get into it, but they've also figured out the woodpecker when it beats its beak against the tree has a, has a structure inside of it that allows it to knock itself, not silly, you know, and, and how can we use that in the design of this baby seat? And so we brought in all that sort of woodpecker technology, uh, woodpecker. the egg shape, the carbon materials, advanced woodpecker technology. As amazing. Hey, it's, no, the thing is, we're not inventing anything. We're just, if you're curious enough, nature already has it out, but the answer is here. Woodpecker has um, like a suspension system, yeah. right? Yeah, so there's a lot of mechanisms. Yeah, it's like a G-force it's limiter. Amazing, amazing system, nature developing something that, you know, it took a million years to get there maybe, but they've done it. So we can't be, I don't know, how can you better that? And we don't have to. That's the ultimate technology. So that, that's been a lot of fun. And then we took it, like you said, Brian, to CES Consumer Electronics Show in January this year, won first prize for the newest, best innovation prize for, for safety. So that's going to save a lot. That's, that's an ama amazing product, amazing product. Yeah, very cool. So really happy about that. Motorcycles. Now we're talking. Yes, <laughs> we have a lot of motorcycles here. So uh, first impressions? You're true. Blown away. I mean, I was probably, I didn't even get in the door and they were like, come on. I was like, no, wait a second. I just <laughs> spent 10 minutes in the door staring. Then I met Mr. Barber himself there and that took about a couple minutes. To, but um, that was fantastic. My first impression is that, again, uh, I don't know how we got to get the message out there. This place exists because I, I, I'm a, you, you know, I'm a huge motorcycle fan, and and I didn't, I probably never would have come out, and I'm sad to say that, but I probably would never would have come out if I, if I hadn't been invited. And now that I see it, it's like I'm going to become a preacher almost, you know, praise it. I guess uh, one of those one of those Mormons that go around the world and try to convert you or something. Um, but no, it's an amazing, amazing place. Go with evangelist. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, but. You know, that it's so well curated. First of all, you got that, like you spoke about, is this an order or actually an organized system to see everything. It's not just to go in there and check out some bikes. There's a real thought process behind the organization of it. And the fact that everything is, you know, every bike, it depends on how interested you are in bikes. And that's why I, I need a few more days in here. Yes. I'm still seeing stuff that I hadn't seen the last couple of days, but but we now know what your favorite motorcycle is, which is but, right out there, the yeah. MH900D, which uh, Pierre is here, actually. Mm. Where is Pierre? Yeah, Pierre's there somewhere. He's, he's back there. Uh, so he's not just saying that because Pierre is here. No, but it is. I didn't know Pierre was going to be here until you told me he was going to be here. <laughs> I actually asked him. You so. asked me on the plane. Yeah. yeah uh, Harry sent me a note, like, is it going to be there? And yeah. you wanted that. That was the one bike you asked. It was gonna I might say why I liked it. I mean, I didn't even tell you, period, why, why I liked it. But for me, um, I find that, I think as a design, like I said, the mechanics is probably the essential beauty of an object. And then we sort of get the bad rap that we just have to dress it. But it's not that. I think a designer has to emphasize the, the mechanical beauty of an object and all the times when I design these supercars and stuff, we show off the, the heart of the, of the car is the engine. So we don't even cover the engine. If it's a mid-engine, we don't even cover the engine. We put a polycarbonate cover over the, the back so you can still see the, you know, the, the magic of the car, the engine. That's the emotional part of the car. But on the uh, MH900E, <clears throat> it's got a sensual body. I mean, I can just, I, that's another bike I would love to watch by hand. Uh, but at the same time, the mechanical components are thought out. They're probably, there's optimization and everything, of course, but you see the engine and you see the heart and the lungs and you know, all those components that make it what it is. And that's why these covered bikes, you know, Desmo Sedici, beautiful, but such a shame that you can't what's see in, yeah. what's underneath it. And I regret, I, I mean, it still makes me tingle and all that, but that makes me more than tingle. And so I like that. It really, and so well for me, well proportioned. I don't, I'm, Pierre, we haven't even discussed it, but for me, it's got so many things right about it. Sounds like it might be a future design talk, Pierre. Yeah. Have to come back and yes. dissect that one. Um, but yeah, it is really striking. And to mm. know the timing at which he, he produced that bike. Yeah. Well, it's a quick process. Four class. Best. 
all around the time of the the triple nine. Yeah, yeah overlapping three months, I think you said. Yeah. Lays it. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So like I said, it's great. It's a good time in history to be here, and extremely excited to see that you have this level here, which not only shows people what we've had in the past, but am I speaking like Kamala Harris? What we had in the past and what we're going to have in the future is a reminder of where, sorry, I don't mean it. <laughs> um, I hope this is MAGA country. <laughs> Below. <laughs> anyway, where are you guys why I hate me now. So the, we have a design center, yes. Yeah. This, this is, and was the reason w when I reached out to you. Yeah. Um, we have this uh, component now at uh, the museum right. that, uh, that talks about the future. And so it builds upon the history of 150 plus years of two-wheeled innovation uh, and gives people a glimpse of what the future may hold for, for transportation, mm -hmm. motorsports and racing. So that's the purpose of this, this room and for you all to experience that and learn as an educational center too. So uh, I wanna say in the last two years since COVID, we've had 4,500 uh, kids yeah. come through here with our, our school programs and they come in here and starting at uh, you know third grade on up uh, they're being exposed to design and engineering and 3D yeah. learning and additive technologies and AI and uh, so it's really yeah, great. Yeah. So I mean, it's very inspiring because I'm sure a lot of us from my generation at least we had no idea what that this design world or being able to influence the future industrial objects even existed until it was almost too late and we're already doing something else. But the fact that you can expose a 10 year old child, to something that, you know, is, it could be a dream. For, uh, I mean, it would change his life. You, know, you influence students who just don't get exposed to this. What happens in a design studio, it's all behind closed doors anyways. You know, most kids have no idea what a designer does. You know, um, and it's, a, it's, I mean, from somebody who's been in there and done it for a while, he, Pierre, you'll know it's, we're blessed. I mean, we get paid to have fun. It's incredible. You know, we draw pretty pictures and we work with guys who make it real and we create babies. So, you know, our thoughts and our minds become real. And, uh, and that process of, of, of development from something that was just a, a, an idea to be it out there and people loving your design and buying it. It's, it's magic. It really is incredible. So, and, and young kids should be inspired by that. You know? Yes. We need that. I, uh, I think about this all the time and I, I see lots of, um, young students, um, curious students, you know, asking questions and, um, uh, one of them, uh, we had one, one class in here that, uh, uh, didn't, had never seen a, um, a 3D printer before yeah. and didn't know what 3D printing was. So we invited him back, um, and spent, uh, actually Pierre came in and talked to him and we just, you know, exposed, um, new technology you know, to a 10 year old. Yeah. And, um, I look at kids like that and wish to, you know, I had those opportunities, you know, I didn't see my first 3d printer till late college. Yeah. Um, and didn't really go to school for computer design, you know, taught myself after I was out of school, you know, yeah. this was the uh, late nineties. So this really is amazing that nine and 10 year olds are doing CAD. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, uh, you know, Tinkercad and, you know, uh, yeah, it's getting into Shaper and, uh, uh, there's so many cool tools out there right now. So where, where are they going to go? You know, yeah. what are they going to see in 10, 20 years? Well, yeah, I think it's, I think it's exponential. I think we've seen change in, you know, from being very manual, the way we created design to now being sort of at a cutting edge where it's ridiculous how much you can compress development, design and development to the point where the kids are going to be coming in now, um, maybe losing a little bit of what we call the human touch, because I think in design, that's absolutely critical. You know, you don't want a, a product that looks like it was designed by a machine. You want it, how much value we put on the human, you know, this is made by a person. Yes, yeah. So we got to be careful that the education sort of still includes a bit of the fundamentals of design. Otherwise, everybody is a designer. You know, the AI today, as we were talking about earlier, Anybody can tell AI program it to say, look, I designed me this that looks like that as if it was that. 
for the year this, and our evolution of that, and bam, there's your idea, and you present it, and yeah, I like it. That is not design, yeah. right? And that makes everybody capable of calling themselves a designer, but it's it's not reality. Right? Do you think uh, AI will ever have the ability to decipher what beauty is? Well, it can only spit out what you put in, basically. Right. So unless you teach it, teach it yeah. uh, what beauty is, it's your classification you're it's still human. human. It's still human. Program. Yeah, and I, I, I'm not against it. I don't want to sound like an old fart, you know, sort of old school guy. And it's actually something that could be beneficial in many, many ways that we haven't been used to. But like, if I had to design, you know, a new car, I'd sit down there and I'd probably churn out about ten designs in a week, you know, fast sketches or whatever. If I punch in and get out a thousand ideas, I'm not going to say no to that. You know, then I might take one of the 10,000 or one of the thousand and say, that's a pretty cool direction. I might fine tune it and put my, f my, f me into that design kind of thing. So in that sense, it's a great provider of additional quantity. I wouldn't say quality, but quantity of, of ideas. And you can't, can't say that's a bad thing. That, that would be stupid. So we have to embrace it, but we also don't have to let it take over our, our jobs. I think, yeah. It's going to be an interesting next decade, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, we, we aim to show a little bit of that here and um, expose uh, more and more uh, younger generations of, mm. of current technologies and design, how to, how to ideate and get, get your ideas out there uh, and show them what's coming and, mm. uh, and, and, you know, what better place yeah. than here. Um, this is the first place I've worked in that had windows. So um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Barber, uh, windows used to be the prison. Yeah, I've always worked in dungeons, dungeons, uh, basements, and that's where they put the yeah. industrial design kids. Yeah, is um, yeah, you might be wondering. That's a good point. Yeah, when we build models, we line the fluorescent tubes up like that, like linear, like that, just to see how the light. You'll notice on Pierre's models here, the light highlights lie on the surface of the vehicle or the shape of the body. Those give us a real sensual, well, give us a better reading of this surface of the vehicles. We wouldn't do it in 90 degrees. You can do it, but we don't do it that way. But we line up the lights and the, the height of the lights to reflect back on the models. That's, this is like a design studio here, isn't it? It is a design studio. Yeah. Yes, yes. Not like it. It is a specific. Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, I had a lot of input. And, yeah, you know, good uh, job. Pierre. Um, Friends of mine, uh, Edgar, uh, Heinrich with BMW, mm -hmm. yeah. um, some some really great talent and input into um, a studio space. If you could have all your dreams come true, what would you put in that space? And yeah, so that that kind of thought went in. Well, we got a couple ideas up to Harry that what we could put into our space here. So we did a small. I don't. You want to show it? Yeah. Well, it's not our. It, this is not. This is like slapping ideas on paper. So don't expect it. So you've never designed a motorcycle. I have. I lost when against Edgar Heinrich Edgar. back in the early nineties at uh, BMW. Mid yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was working with BMW at the time when I, with the X5, the design of the X5 in Munich, and the opportunity came up for them to say, "What would a car designer do on this project?" And let's put him up against the car, uh, a real motorcycle designer. Again, it's like putting me in the ring with Michael Tyson. Now, I might punch him out, but I probably won't. And uh, I lost. But Edgar came up with the design. It was a K twelve hundred, I believe. Yep. And um, so I, 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 but I'm I, I'm hugely enthusiastic about bikes and shapes. So one day maybe we can get something out there. But we did do a few sketches in a in a few days. It just shows you a direction of what a futuristic. Please don't hold me down this because we're not even to refinement. But it's just to show you pretty much what a say a 2030 to 2040 bike could look like. Thinking about the rider of that bike would probably be a kid right now. It was probably seven or eight years old. So, you know, the way they're taught in school now is a little bit different than we were taught. So his tastes are going to be different. And But he still wants to feel that emotional uh, feel that you have when you're on a motorcycle. He doesn't want to sit in a capsule or a car or anything like that. Um, but yeah, maybe Harry can show that. Yeah. So what I've tried to do here briefly, I guess, I don't want to say this is what it looks like, but we're trying to do something that basically shows off the, the mechanical or the electronic components underneath a, a cover. So you still see the, the heart of the bike. And um, 
basically just trying to clothe it in something that is sort of a skin rather than bits and pieces. So you can almost 3D print a body style um, and just blend everything in there. So it almost looks like it was grown rather than built, right? And um, you'll look at those wheels and say, that's impossible. No, they are possible to design wheels like that. Um, it'd be adjustable riding position so the bike can go up and down depending on the type of uh, um, usage if you're on the track or if you're in a city environment or touring on the road or you have things and um, yeah you want active components on the bike you don't want with cars we used to have spoilers in the back of cars we see them all the time but nowadays the whole trend is going to who needs a spoiler at 15 miles an hour in the city right at 50 or 100 miles an hour you might need a spoiler but then you want it to come out be effective and then go back into its resting place so a lot of things like handlebars you don't want them out mirrors and stuff like that when you park the bike you know they get knocked off and things like that or adjustability you want that and uh you want customization so this is showing it with the 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 hand controls retracted yeah yeah, they, yeah i think there might be another image that do we have any other images here in the show no no but yeah the the handlebars are tucked in then when you need them they'll come out and you'll tuck them back in They'll go up and down so you can have different adjustability with the foot pegs, the hip, and the uh, handlebars to create a <clears throat> optimized seating position, I guess you could say a riding position. And again, it's not pretty. I, I agree it's not pretty. There's a lot of things you can do, but it was just a brain uh, explosion for a day sort of approach. Yeah. 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 But yeah, it's that kind of thinking that, you know, one of the most important things is when you have a kid, you don't want to die, die on his motorcycle. So you got to have all kinds of future ideas, not about just looking right, but the bike actually brings safety with it, innovation that we don't have today. So that's, that takes quite a bit of... And safety in um, you know, four-wheeled vehicles is getting more advanced too. So that is going to help motorcyclists. Absolutely. Cars are more aware of the surrounding vehicles. So... Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of movement now in electronics with heads-up display and uh, warning signals. You know, uh, all that kind of stuff is good. And uh, as long as it's done, you know, not not like it's science fiction because I I like science fiction. I'm a huge fan of it, but it can become very um, I don't want to say Japanese, but you know what I mean. So sure, way past what it will well, be. Uh, I'll mention people that we have the uh, Auburn. Uh, in the autonomous racing team joining us today so this is exactly what they're doing this for is okay. to, is to uh develop those technologies better sensors yeah. cars are more aware yeah you know, it's not necessarily to replace racing and drivers uh but they're yeah. doing technologies that are going to make cars safer yeah all vehicles safer so. yeah yeah you know? yeah you know what i mean ha accidents are horrible there might be a few people like to see that kind of stuff but that that is just not what's well, nascar Yes, yes. What is it? Robin is racing? Yeah. Robin is racing? For the, Dar the, the Darlington Stripe? Or are we some of the foot, Chris? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think we have time for a few questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. The car in general? Uh, no, I think the 430. Yeah, yeah. No, well, the 430 was, was scary because we're coming off the 360 Modena which was already there when I arrived at Ferrari. And the brief was keep the platform, keep all the electric and mechanical and, you know, the cooling, thermal components and everything, basically just make the car accept more horsepower and uh, look look better. And for me, the 360 motor is maybe it's not the most beautiful Ferrari, but it was a bit, they were a bit left in the oven a little too long, you know, it sort of got too soft. Soft. And we tried to get a little bit edgier, but we needed to work on, on intake sizes and, the the funny thing about the uh, the fourth the F430 because the 430 Scuderia is slightly different, but the F430 was that car really ran up to the limit in terms of des design release, um, simply because the head of the company Montezemolo Luca Luca di Cordero Montezemolo uh, was not happy with the front end of the car, uh, the, the 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 designs of the front of the car. And uh, it's kind of hard to design a front end for a Ferrari because there is no grill shape for a Ferrari. There is for every other car out there. Uh, they kind of, if it's a front end, it'll have a shape that you look at the grill, you know what the front end, you know what the car is without the badge. 
before I've had so many different grill shapes. I've had the egg carton sort of grill, but the shape of the egg, the, the grill was uh, always different. And he was killing it every time we showed him a new grill and um, graphic. And then uh, we had about a week to go and I had to say, okay, I don't know. I don't know what he's looking for. We showed him everything from, from A to Z. Um, and all I did was go back in the history of Ferrari to see is there any front end on a Ferrari that just looks so uniquely Ferrari that it can't be anything else other than a Ferrari and it's strong graphically. If I looked at what Phil Hill was driving in 61, was that shark nose Ferrari? Um, if you look back a bit of the history, you'll see it. It was just, uh, it's classically beautiful. It looks like a shark nose. And uh, we put that on, clayed it up really quickly over the week in a full size model and then showed it to Montezuma with about a day left before we had to sign off, sign off whatever we had. And he loved it. And so that front end was immediately just approved and we went with that front end and the scooter, which is the one that was downstairs today. Uh, sorry, the F430. Um, that was cool. It was fun. We had pressure right up to the last minute because we were going to come out with a front end that nobody liked anyways. Uh, it was either that or nothing. Um, and on the A bar, that was fun because again, it was that car that um, the Fiat 500 would, as we said, it's a Panda, but with the A bar, it was sort of the pocket rocket, like I said, version. But that was kind of fun because it was almost like designing. Um, well, if you look at the history of the Fiat 500, it never was really a A bar version. You had versions of it, um, but A bar is the performance arm of Fiat, or at least was for many years. And with the A-bars, um, it sort of took away that feminine, nice girl next door look feeling to turn it into something that was a bit, you know, superhuman for its size kind of thing. Um, we didn't change the design a lot. We were talking about, I don't know who we were talking about, that car didn't look wide enough. Um, who was it? Uh, anyways, I'm speaking about the track on the car today, uh, but we had to make it look what we call butch, you know, real kind of tough guy. And um, just fatter wheels on it, a bit deeper growl to the exhaust and uh, graphics, a little bit of graphics, which is the terrible way to do it, but it helps. Um, but it certainly turned it into a car that even women wanted it. So it was success. Yeah, loved it, fun. And nowadays it's just gone all electric. Another question? Thank you very much. I've got another question. Yeah. Uh, Bring your bike over here. You'd love my bike. If you like bikes, you'd love my bike. I've got a, I've got, okay, here's the worst story. It's going to hurt if you hear it because you'll, you'll hear the pain in my voice. Uh, I was just leaving Italy and the uh, 1098 had just come out. 1098 Ducati. Um, there was also an S version. And I thought if I buy it now, I'm going to have to take it to England with me and uh, too much hassle. I'll just wait when I get to England, get, get my 1098. In the meantime, the first few months when I arrived in England, the 1198 came out, which is the improved version of the 1098. And there was the S. So I convinced my wife to let me have some money and buy it. So I bought it. And I was, it's like, she's letting you buy your, um, your mistress, right? <laughs> Doesn't get better than that. So I had my mistress on the first day they delivered it to my house. I had it sitting out on the, on the, on the, uh, on the, on the, where we parked the car, basically. I moved the car and put the bike there and uh, put it up on the stand and uh, started up, kicked it in the uh, first gear and started lubing the chain on it, right? Putting some lube on the chain. I thought, I'm going to let it sit here for a little bit. I'm going to go in the house, make a cup of coffee to admire it. So I'm sitting in the kitchen, looking out the window, watching my beautiful 1198S uh, get its lube cha uh, chain. <laughs> And I watched it vibrate itself off the stand. It's a single-sided swing arm. And it took off down the gravel uh, driveway. And it went, I don't know, 50, 40 yards maybe. It landed on its side. Stuck the throttle wide open and just started spinning donuts in the gravel. And, uh, and it blew up, basically. <laughs> so, and then I, I don't know what. I'm not, I can't just repair that. i got to rebuild it. So I rebuilt it, took it back to zero. And everything, I was like mad. Everything I can throw at it that makes it better wouldn't do that. So I had, I was with McLaren at the time. So I had the opportunity to go down to the carbon department and get a carbon fiber spring made for it. I was the first bike before MotoGP or anybody else started thinking about it that had wings on the front that actually worked on a, on a bike. 
So we went tunnel tested these wings on it. And I, I put it up on a build form on, on Ducati's uh, website. And nobody knew who I was. I was just providing all these images of what I was doing. And you knew this guy is either a rocket scientist or, or some madman. But I received so much shite, I don't want to say the right word, from people who thought, who the hell, what does this guy think he's doing? I was building well, you were the you were the guy that bought the twenty thousand dollar fish, so you're now yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's just guy spending company resources yeah. making your personal bike like he made the bike you always yeah. wanted. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I went from whatever the bike cost that it was like fifteen thousand, seventy thousand dollars. The bike is well over a hundred thousand dollars. The carbon spring is just this carbon spring is insane. Carbon fiber coil spring. Yeah, it was a, it was a great titanium spring to, be, to begin with. But I took it down to the carbon guys. It was like a cha- I don't know if they can make a spring out of carbon fiber. But if anybody can, McLaren's race team can. And they took it on as a challenge. And three months later, they came back, here's your spring. It didn't look like the same spring, you know, the, the tube diameter and the n- number of coils, but it was 110 newton meters of, 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 of spring. And they put it on the machine for me and they started beating, you know, beating it like that. And then the the, the, the rebound and compression was exactly on the same level as with a titanium spring. And I'm like, okay, what if this thing cracks? <laughs> but I've x-rayed it every year. I've x-rayed it and there's no fatigue. So the cap still has the same size. And uh, it's like a brand new spring that weighs nothing. That's unsprung weight, if you know about unsprung weight. That and the carbon wheels are probably the two biggest things that, but everything is, the air box is bigger. It's got high compression pistons and, and um, the crankshafts changed, the connecting rod, uh, the, s- the subframe, the frame, the tank, the panel, the seat. There's nothing on the bike stock except for the instruments, the beautiful display, and the tires because of the DT, uh, DTC, Ducati Traction Control. You have a certain radio profile on the tires. But every bolt, cable, foot, everything, there's nothing stock. And it looks at first glance, you go, oh, it's at 1198S. It's not, it's upgraded. Yeah. Illegal Chinese bulls on the high beams that would blind you like, not legal. This the Pervignoni exhaust that were 70 real liters. Really upset and then angry when that thing went down. Uh, this, it's, it's a, well, you'll have to bring it over. Yeah, bring take it on the track. I haven't been on the trip. I'd love to, yeah. Any other questions? Sure. Matt, yeah. Oh, that's nice to hear. Yeah, because they were, we spent time on those. It wasn't just aesthetic. It, they had to work. And they did work. That's the thing. That, that bike has, because we went up way high with more horsepower. We went way down with the weight. The weight power ratio changed completely on it. But already the stock condition, you could wheelie that bike. The fourth using plumbers. So get the wheel in the air. And uh, if you know about front, traction problems they have sometimes we go into the quarters and a bit more down for it and it's true yeah worked well in the back oh uh push yourself till you almost die probably no seriously i don't know it's uh push yourself harder harder and harder it's the time when you have the energy to do it and you'll bounce back but you can't take it easy when you're young you know it's you won't get you won't get payback later and my father always told me this, that it's, it's so bad for parents to advise their kids and it's all about participation and it's not about winning. That is so wrong. That doesn't mentalize kids for the future, I think. Yeah, you can clap, right? Mm. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, it's, it's tough, but the world's not an easy place. People are going to be backstabbing you all the way up to the top. I, I've, you know, I've got an eye in the back of my head now, I feel, but... Um, Nobody's really going to be happy for you except the people that are super close to you. There's always a bit of envy, and but you got to be honest. That's really, really important. You can't be anybody else other than who you are. That's see you see through that immediately. But yeah, I just I mean, my father was just so not hard on me, but just told me, look, you know, push, you know, don't give up, and but give up is the first step to really give it up, and you can't do that. So. I don't know. It's uh, it's tough, but I'm really happy that I grew up that way, because now I'm sitting here, you know, and I'm looking back at a career that probably will never finish. I don't want to die retired. I just want to keep working until, you know, with my boots on, sort of thing. Great question. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. One more over here. 
Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's why it's tough. I mean, you're ripping off a lot of people's designs that have already been done. The thing is, if you rip off a lot of people's designs, it's not plagiarism. If you rip off one person's design, it's a, it's a criminal act, right? So rip off a lot of people, then you can say, well, it's, you know, it's not him that I ripped off. And, but it is tough because, like you said, AI is, um, is just producing stuff that's already been out there, just you know, mixing the same ingredients in a different way. And you ended up with something that tastes a little bit different, but it's really not innovation per se. And it's not creating work like you. The, the human brain is the best thing out there. You, you can't beat it. You just, I think it might be a bit of a variation, but here's the, the thing that I, I've always felt very strongly about. Um, in, at least in the creative world, you have to be a kid your whole life. And the sad thing is, as you grow older, you lose this sense of curiosity about things and become duller and duller and you stop asking why. You know, and kids all, you know, that's all you hear from is why, 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 and, you know, okay. And then eventually you stop asking why and you end up working in a bank, right? But a, a designer is basically the same. I, I'm as curious as I've ever been as a little kid. And, you know, I might sound, you know, kind of like, laid back up here, but I get home, I'm a kid, you know, it's just, I want to read and I want to watch television, interesting programs and stuff like that. So that, that element of curiosity, regretfully, is something that goes down over a person's lifetime and it just goes down your life. So, um, and I don't know if, if AI can reproduce curiosity, it can sort of reproduce creativity, but before you have creativity, you have to have cre curiosity. And you, that means you have to think like a kid and not be embarrassed to ask stupid questions. They're not, uh, you don't need, questions aren't stupid. You know, they're just ask, ask, ask. But it's hard. I mean, I can't predict where we're going. I have absolutely no idea what AI is going to do to the future generations. I just, you know, if you ask a kid today, what is um, 12 times 12 or, or something like that, he, he goes, I don't know, it's like, tells you what 12 times 12 is. It's not that he's any dumber, it's just that he hasn't learned the basics or anything like that. And uh, that's the fundamentals, I think, are the thing that might help you when you go through that AI phase is knowing if it's the right solution or not. And uh, like I said, it, it's giving you examples of what you could probably optimize later on. And that's how I hope it goes. I don't want AI designing my next whatever. Um, I'd pay more for a person to design it. There's lots of uh, uncertainties with it right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I think that's probably about time. Um, you know, this, is, this yeah. has been really great. Um, cool. Thank you for, for yeah. coming here. And uh, yeah, this is our, our second real design talk um, in, in this space. Uh, we had one last year with uh, Pierre and Miguel, and mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we hope to do a lot more. So just thank you for coming. And Thanks. Uh, thank you for uh, to George Barber, um, you know, the visionary behind this whole great place, the reason we're all here. And mm. um, so thank you. There. Oh, George. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>